You're listening to World Class from the Freeman Smogley Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. We bring expertise on international affairs from Stanford's campus straight to you. I'm Michael McFall, the host of World Class and the director of the Freeman Smogley Institute. Today, we're talking about something that is really scary for most Americans and most people around the world. Actually, I just flew in from Germany yesterday, and that's all anybody at the airport was talking about, the coronavirus. We have two fantastic experts to help us give some perspective to what this moment in our history means. First, we have Karen Eggleston. She's the director of the Stanford Asia Health Policy Program and deputy director of the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center here at FSI. And our research focuses on government and market roles in the health sector and Asian health policy. We also have David Relman. He is a professor in 5,000 places in the departments of medicine and microbiology and immunology at Stanford. He's also the chief of infectious diseases at the Veterans Affairs Palo Alto Health Care System. And he's also a senior fellow at CSAC here at FSI, the Center on International Security and Cooperation. His work has focused recently on human microbial community assembly and community stability and resilience in the face of disturbing trends in the world. Welcome, both of you, to World Class. Let's just start with the basics, even more basic than what I have written down here. What is the coronavirus? Where did it come from? Why should we be concerned? But let's start with just the, you know, the basic science, David. It would be good for, I think, our listeners to know what this is and what it isn't. It would be good to know, too. Sure. It's a new virus, but it belongs to an old family of viruses, some of which you know we know a fair bit about. It's like two recently emerged viruses in the same family. One is SARS and the other right. is MERS. And they both are uh, new viruses to us. They both cause respiratory disease, in some cases severe disease, and have arisen from animal reservoirs and emerged into the human population. So this new virus is like those two recent fellow members of the family, it's a little less like some of the other older members of that family, which cause a common cold. And there are still a number of really important unanswered questions about why did it arise now? Where did it come from? Uh And what's its near-term evolutionary trajectory? Well, can you give us some best guesses about those unanswered questions? I mean, you're more informed than the rest of us. (laughs) Let's start first where it came from. I mean, there are some pretty crazy stories out there. Senator Cotton has put out one hypothesis, but what do you? what's our best guess? What's your best guess yeah. as to where the, it came from? The best guess right now is that this virus arose in bats. It's probably a well-adapted virus for bats. Uh-huh. Probably didn't and doesn't cause problems in bats. And Because has, they've developed immune systems to it? Or, exactly. Uh-huh. They have adapted to these viruses over long periods of time. And the viruses, likewise, don't want to kill off their host because they want to hang out on the planet just like anything else. Right. So that's the best guess, simply because all of the most closely related viruses we know of in the world are bat viruses Mm -hmm. like this. Okay. I didn't know that. So presumably, it came out of a bat. The only important questions are, did it then go into another animal before going into people? Or Uh did it go straight from bats to people? Right. And... Then there are some questions about when did that happen and how did that happen? How many times might it have happened in the last several months, for example? So have there been multiple emergence events or just one? That would affect the the growth rate later on, right? It it would, and it would also help us understand how to anticipate ongoing events like this, further events like it. It would also help address that other lurking question, which I think you and certainly the eminent biologist Senator Cotton is thinking about, which is... Very um, diplomatically stated. (laughs) Could this have had some help? Right. Could this have had some help in a very fundamental way with respect to its evolutionary origins? Was it created by people? And I think the answer to that is probably not. We can talk about why. But the other way in which people could have helped would be, were humans, let's say, folks in China who were desperately trying to understand these bat viruses better, could they have isolated this virus Mm, in months, recent months, maybe in the last year or two, kept it in a big collection in a lab, begun to work on it, and then made a mistake. Made a mistake. And let it out by mistake. Karen, what do you think? 
you know a lot about what happens in China on these issues. What's your kind of best guess well, as to I'm the origins? Well, I'm a health economist, but right. I, a lot of the index patients and all of the cases are linked originally to a seafood market in Wuhan, in Fukuoka uh-huh. province in China. So it's quite likely, similarly to SARS and others, that it made that transition through one of those markets. And all of the original cases in the epicenter being Wuhan was linked to that. And then the draconian cordon sanitaire was on that whole city of 11 million because the epicenter was there. Right. And they've already, it sounds like they've identified that particular market. That means it's probably from the bat or not necessarily? Well, there have been cases and published in the journal and other about transmission within Wuhan and elsewhere, as well as transmission of cases outside of China and how that happens, even when people are asymptomatic, et cetera. Right, right. So there's some, there's some more recent data out of China that looks at the earliest cases and whether they had associations with things like the seafood market, the famous seafood market. Okay. It turns out about only half did. And the other half appear to have had no obvious connection to that market. Could they have been indirectly connected somehow? Or through the movement of animals that ended up in the market, could they too have been exposed? These are things that are unknown. We still don't know. Yeah. Okay. There are two other things, though, about this question of could it have been residing in a laboratory and then accidentally released that are worth mentioning. One is that the place in the world that has the greatest interest and the greatest pre-existing collection of very closely related viruses is in Wuhan. And second, they have published papers in recent years that describe work on similar viruses, bat coronaviruses, where they admit to having used what we call level two biosafety conditions, which are not as high as we use when working with similar viruses. Now that's just all circumstantial. Right. We and I personally still think that it most likely came out of bats, either directly or indirectly, got into people, and then because it was either prepositioned to to spread in people right away or evolved it quickly, did so and got out of control before people were willing to admit they had a problem. Well, let's turn to that question, Karen, in terms of how would you assess the response from the Chinese government from the very beginning to where they're at today? Well, an epidemic can be a stress test for any health system. And although China is much better prepared than it was for SARS 17 years ago, there are certain characteristics of the virus itself, as well as China's economy and connectivity with the global economy, that mean that this is even more of a crisis. Uh They have taken quite stringent measures But there's also a question about initial handling. And as you know, some officials have been dismissed and there's been a lot of controversy. Some prominent people involved in treatment of cases, Dr. Lee Wen Yang and more recently a hospital director, all died themselves with the coronavirus. Tell our listeners a little bit about those people because not everybody's followed the story as closely as you have. Well, there are many unfortunate souls who have succumbed to this virus, right. and many of them are themselves first responders in the health system and right. health protective. And one of the key difficulties is preparing people to respond to this, and when resources are strained, shortage of testing kits, a shortage of protective wear, and so on, and how that's implemented. Uh-huh. Letting, As people know, any crisis management expert or even a good athlete or musician would know that excellent performance under pressure doesn't just happen. Right. right? Excellent good point. performance under pressure takes preparation and investment right. in the days and months and years ahead of time. Right. And that can put extra pressure on a system that's already strained in some respects. There's been lots of reporting that they were that this has been compared to Chernobyl, that they were hiding the information. Would it have made a difference had they talked about it earlier or not? in terms of how the government is responding? Well, it could have. I'd be interested to know your point of view. But, I mean, even if the, the Supreme Court in China... She just pointed recommend- to David, by the way. She's not interested in my point of view. <laughs> just for our listeners there, yes. We're well, going to come to David. No, I'm interested. We'll kind of come to David in a minute, yes. <laughs> but if the Wuhan local officials or the police that had asked, had disciplined some people, that we don't know for sure if Li Wenlang was one of them, were later reprimanded even by the Supreme Court in China, saying that rumor, quote unquote, should have been known sooner. Right. And clearly there's controversy about the initial handling right. and dismissal of those officials. That being said, there are issues. I mean, look at the Diamond Princess in Yokohama. So was that a correct 
call by the Japanese government. Or Explain just in two sentences what happened a there. A cruise ship that was docked outside Yokohama, and they decided to quarantine everybody on board. Right. And then they decided to take some. And then the U.S. chartered plane to take Americans. So what should they have done when Americans tested positive were actually getting onto the flight? Should they then have been stayed in Japan? Should they have been on the plane? There are issues here in California when in San Diego where a person was tested and sent back to the people in quarantine, but it turned out the test was incorrect and they were actually positive. Wow. So I'm just seeing all systems can be stressed. Are being stressed. to invest ahead of time in making our health systems resilient. Interesting. Dave, what, what, yeah, I, what's you your know, reactions it, to that? Part of how, how a system perhaps could or ought to respond has to do with time and how much time you think you have in order to do your prioritized actions. I think there was an understandable misunderstanding of how much time they thought they had with this virus, thinking that perhaps it would spread in the way that other viruses, perhaps like SARS, had spread, which was a little bit slower. And this this coronavirus this, is much faster, this right? This turns out to be spreading more, more quickly. And so that, you know, the and two, why is that? It's likely to be how it interacts with the human host. It's likely to be because it's growing to much higher numbers in the upper parts of the respiratory tract and ready to be transmitted more easily. But there's still some big questions about that. And one of the biggest ones is whether people are contagious before they have symptoms. Uh huh. And that is perhaps the most critical question as to whether this is going to be contained in the very near term or not. Help everybody understand why if, that's the case. If you, if you can't know whether someone is contagious because There's of, a long incubation phase, is that right? There's a long incubation phase when someone has no symptoms. If, meanwhile, they are contagious during that period of time, you have no way of knowing who those people are that harbor virus and are contagious. Right. Typically, and this was the case with SARS, it was only when someone had symptoms that you could say, wait a sec, something's not right, maybe they have this virus, let's isolate them immediately. Here, that may not be the case. In fact, it probably is not. And that's going to make things much more difficult. More complicated. Kara, what's been the reaction, you know, just your uh, inside China right today? I've seen anecdotal things about how society's reaction. Are people panicked? Do they have faith in the government? I mean, the government does seem to be aggressive. They built a whole hospital after all in a few weeks so and on the one hand you might say well that's a signal that they're taking things very seriously and on the other hand people might be disappointed in what's your best guess as to how society as a whole is reacting to this crisis well understandably everybody's under a lot of pressure and uncertain there's a lot of uncertainties and we might emphasize that there's been remarkable global scientific cooperation to try to understand, but as the outbreak unfolds, there's a lot of uncertainty, as we just heard, about how it's transmitted, how best to control it. But we can ask ourselves, would the U.S. have shut down all of New York City had there been 17 deaths in New York City? Probably not. Would we Unlikely. shut down the well, whole I don't know. West what do you Coast? Think? Yeah. That's an interesting 60 question. 60 million people? Yeah. If there have been 700 people infected? I, th I think we would not have, in part because we have folks who have studied this course of action and its consequence for the movement of critical resources and the trade-offs that one assumes, you know, good and bad. And I think we probably would have not reacted as aggressively, but there's some sweet spot in the middle that I think neither of us have right. quite right. right. And it varies according to the virus, political system, resources available, and the willingness of the people to trust in their system. And building trust is so important. And China, of course, is a very large country, and different jurisdictions right. are handling it differently. You can mandate that everybody wear a face mask. How are they supposed to get the face masks? Right. So some places, like Hanzhou or Zhejiang, will distribute them so that the vulnerable have access. But other places, you can't go out without one, and you can't get one. What are you supposed to do? Right. So different jurisdictions is that right? so have that, different that, ways of handling it. Interesting. Yeah. And there are other important resources now that are at risk, like food. Yes. So, for example, because of the, the shutdown and restriction on movement, feed has not been able to be delivered to many poultry and chicken farms in China. And there was a recent decision to kill 100 million chickens because they can't million? get food to them. Wow. And so this then 
turns around and impacts on the food availability to the people. And so you can see where the flip side of an overly restrictive approach has all kinds of negative consequences. Yeah, and it's the poor and most vulnerable that at least afford to go for weeks right. or months without work. They can't door dash their food. Right. I mean, they're the ones those who... vulnerable, they're, oh. they are suffering. We'll come to prescriptions in a minute, although we're already talking about it. But give us a sense, and I know this is an impossible question, so I, uh, of what you think is going to be the magnitude of this virus, first in China, maybe Karen, and then globally. What do you think, David? It's a little early to say. You probably knew I would say that. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, uh, For the sake of the record, it is February 18th today. Yes. And there have been recorded about 73,000 cases worldwide, okay. of which 72,000 have occurred in China. But the latest data from China suggests that there may be a slowing in the spread of disease in China. To me, the big question is, or twofold. One, this issue of how is that virus transmitted? Are asymptomatic people now going to start spreading it and we and, still don't know that. And we still don't know that right. for sure, or the degree to which that may be true. And then the other issue, related issue, is what's going to happen now in other countries where there is virus, small numbers of cases, but maybe a less capable public health system? Let's say in mm. Malaysia, I see. where there are now 30 or 40 cases. What happens in a place like Malaysia, especially if the virus can spread before someone is symptomatic? What do you think, Karen? Same question. Well, I think there's considerable evidence that, that it can spread before people are symptomatic. I mean, they documented cases from Europe and elsewhere in Taiwan recently. So I think, and that complicates, and you can speak to the science of this, right? If the virus can spread before the typical ways of trying to contain it work, then it's more likely it'll spread broadly and then generate transmission within other countries. And there are many health systems in the world that are quite vulnerable to this, as we know. And, you know, China could blame the U.S. for shutting down travel, but it was probably the DPRK that was the first to shut down travel, and with reason, right? Mm -hmm. Weaker health systems have a harder time right. to cope. Again, I know we're all speculating, so we'll have you back in a few months and see where we're at, but tell us about how you think this ends, both scientifically in terms of uh, the policies, both in China, here in the United States. Is this something that can be contained within months, like six months from now, will we not be talking about this? Or will this still be um, a part of our threat assessment? Here's just one take. We will be successful in suppressing the majority of spread. The numbers will start to slow, but they will continue. And there will be hot spots periodically in various parts of the world as okay. there are flare-ups and transmission events spread until there are very vigorous, unusual efforts in those places as well. And I think come summer, we know that for these viruses, summertime weather, warmth and humidity impede transmission. Okay. Well, so that's a, that's good, a good thing. Right. And I think by summer, we'll be looking at slightly more stable times, but probably a future that now includes the persistence of this virus periodically especially in winters, for the next several years, several probably, years. until we have a good vaccine and drugs and the means of distributing and paying for them, which is probably the bigger problem. And how long will it take to have a vaccine? Best guess, you know, would be a good seed test vaccine within months, but good data to suggest that we need to scale up, and it's worth scaling up, not until summer or fall, and then lots of vaccine not until sometime late this year, early next year. Interesting. Do you share that assessment, Karen? More or less? He's the expert. Well, I know that's no, it. No, no. <laughs> but the social and there economic is no, implications there is will no continue answer here. for a long time. So it'll be with us for a long time. Yeah. And although this is quite different from SARS, and one might point out, most of the people that analyze health policy in China will say that that was a salient event that bumped health reform way up the political agenda right. and led to China to achieve universal health coverage and lots of investment in their public health system. But as we know, those investments tend to recede as other priorities come to the fore. So right. the crisis will encourage some reassessment of that. Over the long haul. Over the long haul. And that will be true here and elsewhere. Where we also in suffer all countries, from, so right. You know, we always suffer from this 
you know, waxing and waning attention and willingness to commit. So how frightened should Americans be? I know that's one of my last questions. Give us the perspective of the parameter. I, 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 I think a, it's... I'm basically a bit of an optimist. I, I would reassure most people listening to believe that we will keep this manageable until we have better means and a better understanding of how best to minimize right. large-scale effects. We will have more disease in the United States, for sure. Will it get out of control and cause hundreds of thousands of deaths? No, it will not. Okay. But it will be it will be worse than the seasonal flu. Right. Well, on that cautiously optimistic note, maybe we'll wrap up for now, but I want to make sure that both Karen and David will come back and talk to us on World Class once we have some more data to assess how this is playing out, first and foremost in China, but also around the world. Thanks for joining us today. Pleasure. You've been listening to World Class from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. If you like this episode, please review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps new listeners find the show. And be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on what is happening in the world and why.